when she gave her life to Jesus, alcohol didn't just go away. Before my wife was my wife, all the way back when we dated, my wife went to church some, but it was everything. we It was all we did. I, both my parents were pastors, and easily five out of any given seven days were spent in a church on godly things. So to meet somebody who had a, a more casual relationship, or rather kind of not one, but I, I could tell right away she had the fruit of the Spirit in her personality. She just didn't have the like Christianese to define it. And so I, I say all that just to give you the context that we dated for about a year and then, you know, kind of got into conflict with each other, realizing that one, I knew that I loved her and wanted to marry her, but had big reservations about marrying someone who didn't just profess to be a Christian, certainly at the level that I did. After about a year, we split up. And in the three months apart was when my wife realized that she had an irregular relationship to alcohol. That really came to a head for her. In that summer, she had an experience. She had an incident with alcohol. She blacked out. She woke up in the back of an ambulance. They were taking her. They had found her outside of Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, Massachusetts, and were taking her to the hospital. And that was a big wake-up call for her. And so after that experience, she was just driving down the road one day and cried out to the Lord. And God met her in that in that moment. And she gave her life to the Lord right there in the car. I mean, it's the car that I now drive her and my, I got dropped off at the airport this morning in that car and to think that like that is where she was. And I hadn't seen her, spoken to her in three months. I didn't know that she was gonna be there. And she walked in and I had, in, in Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky, there's about 15,000 seats. I bought a ticket to go in to watch a basketball game and in she walks and she had the ticketed seat next to mine. I was seat 24, she was seat 25. And I could have melted into a puddle and I could not have disappeared fast enough because I'm thinking, you know, oh my gosh, here's this person like I don't, you know, we split up in not good terms. And then she walks and she says, I, I think we need to talk. And I was like, no, I don't. I was not a good boyfriend or husband. I don't want to talk to you. You're right. Whatever you have to say, you're right. And we we talk, and she tells me a story about how God's changed her life. And in October of this year will be my wife's fourth year of sobriety. And I think that growing up, not wrongly believing in the like miraculous delivering power of the God that we serve, and that is some people's story. But for us, when she gave her life to, to Jesus, alcohol didn't just go away. When I think about what walking out sobriety from alcohol or from any substance, what, what does that look like on a daily basis? You know, when somebody's struggling, it's easy to kind of, after a while, when you're your care starts to wear thin and you can start to get a little impatient with people and then to realize like I think this is this is what Jesus was talking about when he was saying like when somebody asks you for your shirt give them your jacket too you know you hear people when they talk about struggling with substances of any kind pornography or drugs or alcohol referring to it as a disease and as somebody who didn't struggle I was so at an arm's length with that sort of terminology and just like, but when you realize someone that you love is maybe as often as every minute in a fight and that fight is life or death, it just helps you. I feel like it just changes your perspective versus, well, why, why wouldn't they just give this up? Like, don't, don't they just love me? Like, don't they love their kids, their wife, their... You know, it's easy for me on the other side of the fence to think like, how, how can you not just give this up? This this thing sits in the driver's seat of, of someone's life. 
And it, you know, it's like, this isn't them choosing something over you. And I think for me, like once I was able to get there mentally, you're so much more likely to like lock arms and, and walk through this thing together because it's, it isn't personal. This is, this is someone treading water and, and me standing there with a life preserver like, well, like if you loved me, you know, I'd be glad to throw it to you, but you just seem to like treading water more. It's like, that person is drowning. Why don't you get in and go with them? <laughs> There's, there's a whole other video that we can make about my personal struggles because I, the thing that was sitting in the driver's seat of my life was me. And so the, whether it was lust or it was acceptance or it was pornography or it was like regardless of, I don't feel like I ever had one consistent thing, but the, that driver's seat is supposed to have Jesus sitting in it. And I know that but it's, it's just easier for me to be critical of someone who just puts one thing there versus me sitting myself in that seat and saying, I know what's best. Just like I'm asking them to remove themselves from the driver's seat of their own life, I have to be willing to take how important I am to their recovery out of the equation. What we truly have to hope for is that that person falls in love with Jesus and ends up looking more like Jesus, not more like me. The temptation is to feel like you have it together. And I just, that was not the case for me. Just because my like troubles are private doesn't mean that they're better. And I think once I was able to humble myself and like I said, realize that the best thing I can do for someone that's drowning is to get in and swim with them then it was, it was no longer about me. Their recovery was not about me. And that was kind of when the, the switch flipped. <laughs>